let's pray Lord we thank you for the ability to be here tonight Lord this is the meeting house but we are the people and we are the church and so Lord we thank you Lord for the spirit that knits us together Lord that we would come tonight Lord both to study to pray and also to sing and to worship you Lord even in this time Lord the things that we're doing are acts of worship even studying and praying Lord, as the praise team practices tonight, Lord, may it be done in a bathed in prayer, Lord, and worship. May it be coming from their hearts as individuals. Lord, may everything that's be said and done here tonight be pleasing in your sight. That we would leave here, Lord, more like Jesus than when we came. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I do want to mention uh, a pretty important person beginning tonight. Uh, Miss Brenda Russ, our church secretary, called me today and gave me um, some information, which I'm not at liberty to share at what all is going on with her, but she's gonna have a surgery uh, uh, come September 12th. And um, it's not, um, it's not a, an elective surgery. And so I want to pray for her in that regard. She'll be off that entire week of the 12th of September and hopes to return the following week. But it, it's something that you'll know next week uh, the fuller details of it, but she wanted to wait until her family knew all the details first before it was made public. So she's on, should be on our prayer list for basically, um, you know, an unspoken type request. And so we want to um, remember her in that regard. And that's Brenda Russ, our church secretary. And so going from top to bottom on our church family, continuing to remember uh, Annie Ruth uh, and Barbara Stewart. Um, I did not see Annie Ruth. Sunday. Did anybody see her? Did I miss her? I saw her Friday, I believe it was. She was gone. She still was not feeling well. Yeah. Okay. So continue to keep her in prayer. Obviously, she was not feeling well enough to be with us on Sunday. Likewise, the same as for Barbara Stewart. She still uh, continues not to feel well at, at home. Um, I talked with um, Bill Reeves last uh, last Sunday. We were walking across from the uh, education building over here, and I noticed that last week all it said on there was praises, and so I went ahead and elaborated on that a little bit. You know, the 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 health report that he got about his kidney disease was is that with the changes that he's made to his lifestyle and his living and his diet, he's went from stage four kidney disease to stage three. So that's very good, that's very encouraging. Um, the things that he's learned about what he eats and how they make him feel. He's also noticed that his angina that he has experienced in the past and had chronically experienced angina is lessened if not gone because of some of these changes that he's made to his lifestyle and diet. He's lost about 20 plus pounds and changed a lot of the things that he's eating to make sure that certain things that were in those foods at one time are no longer getting into his system to cause uh, some problems for him. And, and he's very encouraged by that. He feels better. He feels like getting up and doing things. And so I'm, I'm thankful for that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing, uh, that old phrase. What was the phrase? Junk in, junk out. That's somewhat that's so true about what we put in our bodies. And so we need to think about that. Too much of a good thing can also be a bad thing. And so I know of people who take supplements, and, and I actually know, I've watched, I watch those programs sometimes on t TV that talk about how people die, you know, a mystery of how that died, and then comes back, and there was one that was on there, was taking so many supplements, all the supplements killed her. Like, oh, wait a minute, too much of a good thing can actually kill you. And so we need to do everything with moderation and uh, do things that will profit us and benefit our bodies as well. Continue to pray for Debbie. She had today a another th thoracentesis. That is the fifth one since February. Um, the actually it'd be the fifth one since yeah fifth one since the end of February, which if you count the months, that's pretty regular. And it's getting to be so regular that if it gets a little bit tighter on the frequency, is mean more frequent, um, they might put a drain tube in that that long. So she's concerned about that. Uh, we did go to chemotherapy on Tuesday, and they did not give her all of her chemotherapy regimen because of her platelets were very low. And so, um, you know, when you take chemotherapy, it does certain things to suppress certain activities in the body. And, and, and it, though it had the numbers going in the right direction, here again, too much of a good thing causes other things. And so they're not able to give her the chemotherapy. And that, of course, 
upset her greatly on her way back we discussed you know how this might affect her getting put on a transplant list because if she's not in remission then she can't even begin the clock to get onto the transplant list and so that's very upsetting so the last we know of she was in that quote unquote normal range which would be indicative of remission but we'll find out next week when we go they'll do a whole new blood work panel and they'll look at that again they'll reassess whether they need to restart the the three-part regimen again with their chemo based on our blood work again and if not we're just going to have to we'll see the doctor then so we'll have to talk about what does this mean and um, so it's usually a couple of days after they do that full blood panel that we know whether her numbers the stuff that indicates whether she's in remission or in the normal range so we won't even know next Tuesday when we're up there and actually it'll be week before because they cancel next week so we're sk skipping a whole week and then going back on the last week of the month so she's very concerned about you know how she's not being able to receive what she thinks would be beneficial in that and so um, just pray for her in that in that thing and she continues you know not to do well as far as being able to get up and do things so beginning in July she's pretty much been wheelchair bound she doesn't walk very much anymore I mean she can get up from the pew for example and go to the chair but it's there's a risk there that she's really understanding the dangers of falling because if she fell she couldn't get back up by herself so pray for her in that respect also pray for me um we're putting a ramp on the house and uh we're also having a security company come in a friend of mine and do some things that make it more accessible for her and also uh, if she were to fall it would give us indication of that and it would immediately call somebody and say are you okay and if there's no answer then of course ems is you know dispatched accordingly so we're doing that, uh, and some of that work, uh, two of those pieces of work will happen tomorrow. Hopefully uh, all of it will be completed tomorrow, and I'll feel a little bit better about even being away from her for right now. Right now, Joanne's over there with her, just in case you were wondering. Um, so I bribed Joanne. I said, if you come over, I'll buy food, you know, feed you. So uh, she's over eating rotisserie chicken, uh, potato salad, and uh, corn right now, so... Um, but pray for me in that regard, trying to keep all the balls in the air with taking care of her. Um, it was good to see Kendall and Isabella here Sunday, uh, both for the service and after the service. Pray for that young couple as they begin their journey together. Hey! Pray for that young couple as they begin their journey as husband and wife. Um, Kendall's um, 40 years old and you know like his mom said for 20 years she's prayed for the right person for him and right now what they're having to adjust to is some some financial instability because when they came together the government looks at Kendall a little differently than they did when he was single and so there's a little bit less money than there was just a few weeks ago for for the couple to survive on and you know we all know that there's certain necessities that have we have to have and so that's I'm not sure what her occupation or what, if, even if she does work, what that might be. And so, of course, they're here in Lake Forest. And so, you know, it's a good place to be if you need to have a relatively low overhead for housing. And so that's a good thing for, for him and for her as well. So pray for Kendall and Isabella in that regard. It's good to see Ricky tonight. Uh, she continues to do well with her back, do you? Good. That's good. So we'll praise the Lord for that. Um, let's see. Um, Sylvia, how are you doing this evening? Doing better. I had COVID. Yeah. I know. Have you have you recuperated completely, or are you still a little bit under the weather? Yeah, I'm over it. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. 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 How about? Um, you know, you're supposed to have some uh, appointments, some CTs, and some stuff like that, some consultations. I have some appointments coming up next week and uh, the week after. So I'll hmm. stay with it. Okay. All right. We'll continue to pray for those 
to be favorable reports from those appointments and timing wise would be good for you and to get things resolved for quickly okay mm-hmm yep yep and you know with the things that we just I, I don't know about you but I saw the five o'clock news and if you watched the five o'clock news on WECT there was wasn't a very favorable report about the hospital and its staffing situation and so maybe that might not necessarily be a bad thing you know that you are put off a little bit that way staffing might be a little bit better in your case and so yep all right um and then finally, the last on our church family here, let's continue to remember uh, Wanda as she continues to recover from all the activities that she had uh, purview over for the last few weeks. Um, she, was, uh, she was in rare form this past Sunday, and um, Kendall said, you picked the right word when you said boss. <laughs> so uh, continue to pray for her. All right, how about you? What's going on with you, uh, your other requests, f friends of the family, co-workers, and things of that nature? What about you? I think it was a praise to see Pat up on her own two legs. It was all super lofty. Yep. She was, so I told her, slow and steady wins the race. Mm -hmm. She's moving real slow, but it's just awesome yep. to see her on her feet. Yep, I did notice that Sunday uh, afternoon over at the social. Uh, she would come scuffling by me, and I made comment of her when she got sat down. I didn't want to talk to her while she was walking, but uh, she, it was good to see her in motion like that. So, Mr. Bill? She had two doctor's appointments today. One was infectious disease doctor, and he seemed to be pleased with where she's at. And then the other was her orthopedic, and they took out the stitches today. Okay, so infectious disease doctor said they were pleased with what things look like. And then secondly, stitches were taken out today, so that's a good thing too. So we can just continue to pray that uh, no infection would come, that she would still be uh, willing and able to participate in PT. I did notice that her knee was a little stiff. It wasn't quite bending very much. And so um, that's an issue um, that could be problematic if it stays that way so all right I told her we could move it for her and she said oh no uh, and, and I understand her hesitation to have somebody move it for her because I remember my PT guy when I had a show um, um, rotator cuff surgery said well you can go home and t teach your wife how to do these things and so I was sitting there on the floor and uh Next thing I know, and she says, well, what do I do? I said, well, you take, take that thing and make it come over here like this behind my head. And I had it like this, and she grabs a hold of it and goes, and I'm like, no. I said, you're fired. <laughs> As I'm rolling over on the floor, you know. So it, it, it is a touchy. It's a, it's a fine line between pain to gain and pain of no gain. So, anyway, yeah, yeah, Scott was there too. I mean, um, it, it's, it's, it's an experience that if you've not had it, don't recommend it. That's right. That's right. Any others? Eva told me Sunday that she's getting a new pacemaker on September 4th. Really? Okay. All right. Well, let me... Um, All right, Eva Cannon, a new pacemaker on September 4th. That's interesting because she stops in and sees me every Sunday morning, and she told me that last Sunday morning that the doctor had told her that there wasn't nothing wrong with her pacemaker. And so, but the battery might be low, and so, you know, changing the battery, but they might not, the thing might be so old that they just changed the whole thing out. I don't know. But, uh, Said she needs more power. 
She needs the 22 kW versus the 12 kW. Okay. All right. I told her, I said, just have them turn it up so you can do some laps around this place. So, anyway. All right. Um, anything else for our church family, friends, you folks? Other requests? Real? Everything going good? Uh, she continues to do well, um, all things considered. She's, she, she picked up my father from the hospital, um, which means that she was able to get out of her house into the Tahoe, the Chevy Tahoe, drive to the hospital, wait for him to be brought out and get in. Uh, so she's able to do that, which is pretty remarkable, considering that about a month ago we were saying, you know, she hadn't driven since last August because of her immobility and so that's a pretty remarkable thing so you know she but she still has a long road to to walk without any type of aid if she gets back to the place that she could walk with a cane that would be quite remarkable so she has one of the upright walkers and she has one of the chairs like Wanda has as well and so she's able to get about with those two instruments whether she'll get away from those instruments, I, I can't say. But I know that she wants to get away from them, if possible. So I know that uh, three times a week that um, she has home health care that comes in and changes. She still has wounds that need dressings changed uh, every other day. And so three times a week that home health care comes in and does that for her. So I know that's still ongoing. So that's still a concern for infection purposes there. Anybody else? All right. Well, if there's no other request, let's just continue to remember the world around us. Uh, there's still a war in Ukraine going on. There's still people dying uh, at an alarming rate, ever, ever hastening rate all around the world, and many of which don't know Jesus. And if we were to pray for anything as a priority, it would be first salvation f for people and secondly salvation in the circle of friends that we have, friends and family. And so I hope that you have your own personal list that you pray for day in and day out for people that don't know Jesus. And then for the people who do know Jesus, that they would know him more and reflect him more accurately so that others would be drawn to Jesus. I think there's lots of lots of opportunities these days in the cultural climate that we're at is that if we would truly be an accurate reflection of Jesus that people would be attracted to Jesus and then also be saved by Jesus rather than attracted to religion and just be left alone in their own wayward thought in the midst of religion. So there's a lot of that that goes on these days as well. So pray for that. Uh, you know, on the prayer list, there is a section in there. And if you have somebody specifically that you want to have prayed for, there's a section in the prayer list, prayer for salvation. So just let me or Brenda know, and we'll put that in there and uh, keep those things before the whole body at the same time. Okay? Anything else? All right. Let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. I'll begin us in a moment of prayer, a time of prayer. If you want to pray, you can pray silently or out loud and then i'll close this out we'll get to matthew chapter six and what we would call the model prayer or the disciples prayer let's pray
Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you tonight in an attitude of humility and thanksgiving. Lord, for when we look out on this world and all of its great complexities, Lord, we know there has to be a creator and sustainer of all that we see. Lord, from the stars in the sky and the planets in their orbits, Lord, even the, the things that are right before us, the plants and the animals. Lord, none of these things are mistakes. They didn't happen by accident. And so we thank you for being a creating and a sustaining God. A God that creates that he might have a relationship uh, with that, those things which he has created and an intimate relationship and a special relationship with those things, I mean, namely us as human beings that are created in your image, unlike anything else in the known universe. Uh, who is man, the psalmist said, that you would even take notice of him? except that the indelible fingerprint of God would be upon each and every one that would walk the face of this earth. What is man except the image of God? And that is the reason that you take note of him. And that is the reason that you take pleasure in him. And that is also the reason that you experience pain because of him. Lord, when sin comes into this world or came into this world, it caused you distress. Not that you would be anxious about anything, but that's not your intentions, and never was your intentions. But because you gave us something called free will, Adam and Eve chose, and then according to their cho choice, there were consequences, consequences of which we live today. Many of which, Lord, are on our prayer list. When we think about sickness and disease, literal genetic sickness, Lord, diseases like cancer, uh, diseases like aging even uh, Lord th these are n none of these things were ever intended uh, when you created Lord but we pray to you because you know things uh, intimate details Lord you can fix these things and you will fix these things one day in the ultimate sense of being fixed but Lord in the midst of that we pray and beseech upon you and we plead with you Lord that that you would be merciful and gracious to these that we've mentioned and also oh, many more that we've not mentioned. We also thank you for the things that we have seen that you've given us capacities and abilities to, to be uh, compassionate and merciful toward one another through medicine. Lord, I thank about Ricky here tonight, Lord, enjoying the relative comfort from the discomfort that she once had. And Lord, we thank you for those things. Lord, for many others that have been sick and are now better, we think of Sylvia. Lord, we think of how others that are amongst ourselves. We think of Leanne and there's Jay and, and Lisa. And so, Lord, you've given not only recuperative powers to science and medicine, but also to the body. And so, Lord, we thank you for these things. But, Lord, you also gave us something else. You gave us this thing called intercessory prayer. Uh, as we've learned over the last few weeks and Sunday, that, that the prayer of the righteous and mature can accomplish much. That when we live by faith and we pray in faith, that, that our prayers can be heard and we know that they're heard. And when they are in accordance with your will, that amazing things can happen if we would dare to ask. And so we thank you, Lord, for prayer. Lord, uh, something that we don't utilize as much as we ought to. And Lord, we ask your forgiveness in that regard. But Lord, I, I pray that as we continue to dwell on this subject of prayer in Wednesday evenings, Lord, that you will knit our hearts closer to you, Lord, because prayer is not only how we ask things of you, but it's how you speak back to us as well. So through your word you speak, and through prayer you speak. And Lord, through your Holy Spirit, speak to us tonight as we look into prayer a little deeper to understand what's in the name. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We've been on the odyssey of talking about prayer for quite some number of weeks. We began that odyssey in John chapter 12 when we looked at what is typically called the high priestly prayer. That is the prayer that Jesus prayed the night that he was taken into custody to be taken to be crucified the following day. And we marveled at the type of prayer uh, that Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed a prayer there in chapter 17 that was rooted in faith and the trust that his father would hear and the requests that he made were not just for himself, 
but they were far-reaching. They were not only for the disciples that heard that prayer, but they were also for the disciples that would come after these disciples were actually deceased. So he prayed a prayer that had far-reaching consequences, which had very many benefits. And so in the midst of all the turmoil that the world had, Jesus prayed that we would have his peace and that his peace would be full in us. In the midst of all the life's trials and tribulations, that we could have joy in the midst of it and that his joy would remain. He also prayed that we would be kept from the evil one or the world of evilness in there that we would not be taken out from it because what we were called to do as human beings created in the image of God and namely children of God was to be salt and light to the world. So Jesus' prayer was pretty marvelous in many respects, but then we turned our attention to how to pray. And for that, we went into Luke 1 where the disciples had been watching and and by the time we get to Luke chapter 11, a lot of Jesus' ministry had transpired in the Gospel of Luke. And in Luke 11, 1, the disciples ask a question in the form of a statement. And it went this way. Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. Now, let me just ask you something. Why do you think the disciples asked Jesus that question? Why do you think the disciples would make such a statement to Jesus. Think about it. Okay, so wanted to make sure that God Father heard their prayers. Okay. It also seen other people praying standing down the street corner and rubble on top of a hill, being loud and boisterous and repeating things over and over, and that wasn't right. So I'm sure they wanted to know what was right in comparison to that. Okay, you 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 point out a very good um, differentiation between what they had seen of others compared to what they seen Jesus practice in prayer. All right? So along those lines of that differentiation, again, why would they say, Lord, teach us to pray? Okay, all right. So if you want to know, Ask the one that knows, right? Right? Any, any other ideas? Well, here's something I want you to think about. Now, chronology in the Bible sometimes can be tricky. So what I'm saying is when you take the Gospels and you try to overlap the chapters and the verses, what you find out is that there's this Gospel, Matthew will have this account, and it'll have a similar account in Math or Mark, but no account in Luke, and maybe something that's vaguely similar in John. And then you'll find the exact opposite, that John has something that none of the Gospels have. And so chronology and the storyline of what happens is sometimes tricky. But I want you to think about something. In the, in the ministry of Jesus, when Jesus began, he chose men and he told them why he chose them. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So the goal of them following him was to be taught by the master. That's what rabbi can be mean or understood to mean as master. And they, as a disciple, literally the word disciple means pupil. And so you have a master and you have a pupil and he says, follow me and I will teach you, get the idea of a teacher and a master and a pupil to be fishers of men. And so Jesus spent some years with these fellows, and, but in the midst of this, he not only taught, you know, you know, you have heard that it was said, well, I say, or in, in your ears this day, this prophecy has been fulfilled, or you know, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with mind, and all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. 
So that was something a little new to put those things together like that. And so that's just straightforward teaching. But there came a time when Jesus went from teacher to the one who led them into the application of what they had been taught. And so Jesus, remember, sent out, at least on two occasions, depending upon how you read the Gospels, he sent out his disciples to do uh, gospel ministry work to proclaim the day of the Lord or the kingdom of God. And in one occasion, uh, they came back and it was at, after the, the, the instance of the Mount of Transfiguration, when they came back down off the mountain, Peter, James, and John were up there with Jesus and they seen Elijah and Moses and they, they were on the mountaintop high, right? Well, in the meantime, the rest of the boys, so to speak, were down in town doing what the master had left them to do but they had came to this place, this impasse, when they were out healing and casting out demons and doing all these things, they came to this impasse where they were not able to do what they had been asked to do. They weren't able to cast out the demon from this young boy. And when Jesus came down the mountain with Peter, James, and John, there they're confronted by this man and says, well, your disciples weren't able to do this. And Jesus went ahead and dispatched it but not before saying these kind only come out with prayer and fasting. I believe that's the idea behind what the disciples were saying. Lord, teach us how to pray. In response to what we've seen you do and be so successful at, in response to all of our failures in trying to apply what you've taught us, Teach us to pray so that we will be successful in what you've called us to do, to be fishers of men, to have power to cast out demons and to heal the sick. In order, remember, that the, the miracles weren't for the miracles themselves to be known, but for the gospel to be validated. That was the mark of the validation of the word of God being dispensed. And so in order for the gospel to be validated in the Jewish Greco-Roman society that were, there had to be some stamp of authenticity, easy for you to say, there had to be some stamp of authenticity that the gospel would be made known to be markedly different than other things. And we can see this even in the Old Testament. Remember when, when Pharaoh was approached by Moses, you maybe Cecil B. DeMille, you know, Charlton Heston, the whole thing, throw down the thing, and it became a serpent, and they threw down theirs, and theirs became snakes, but yet this snake swallowed up all the others. All the things that happened in, in the plagues that were, uh, you know, the miracle plagues that were, you know, happening there were direct assaults on Egyptian gods. And what it did was it proved your God is inferior to my God. Go all the way back into the, the days of Daniel, for example, when, when Daniel was taken out into a Babylonian captivity originally by Nebuchadnezzar and all the way through his Persian, Medo-Persian exile, every time that Daniel got put in a pickle, particularly with Belshazzar and also Nebuchadnezzar, after the, after the, the you know, the big, uh, what would you call it, the climax, you know, the tension point was resolved, Nebuchadnezzar said, Daniel's, Daniel's God is the most high God of all creation. He's the God of all gods. And see, the purpose for the miracle uh, of the fiery furnace and for the lion's den and all that was to magnify and lift up God in the face of people who thought they knew what a God was, but to show them that that's not a God at all. And so when these disciples say, Lord, teach us to pray, I believe somewhere in the background, at the very least, was this idea that success of their mission depended on being a prayer like Jesus. Hence, Lord, teach us to pray. And that's why in chapter 11 of Luke, there's words that are a little bit shorter and more succinct than what we find in chapter 6 of Matthew. And so we take the longer text because it provides a little bit more teaching room inside the text. And we read in verse 9 there of chapter 6, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Many commentators end right there the Lord's Prayer, but I want to go ahead and read 14 and 15. 
It says, For if you give, forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Very interesting two sentences there. So, we began f focusing on this last week, and we, no we said that there were two divisions in here, and the two divisions were, that's right, God and us. So, there was the first part of the Lord's Prayer uh, we looked at as being simply f focused on God. Now, when we said they were focused on God, what did we mean? They tell us something about God, and they tell us to do something with regard to God, don't they? And so we begin the sentence there, and it says, Our Father, okay, in heaven, hallowed be your name. So let me ask you, and I've asked you this already, and so you should have really good answers. What's it mean to be hallowed or to hallow his name? Okay, to hold it as sacred, all right. To honor him, right? Well, anything else? How about some more, um, you know, readily accessible on the shelf kind of ideas like respect, revere, maybe even fear? You know, Edward's famous sermon. And it's a perilous thing to fall into the hands of an angry God, right? So there's that, there's that idea. Pardon? Venerate. Venerate. Yeah, that's right. That's the word you looked up. That's right. And there's nothing wrong with looking words up. Matter of fact, if we looked more words up, we'd probably find out that we didn't really know the definition of the word to begin with. We use them in so many ways. Uh, sometimes we don't use them right. So let me just ask you a question here. Um, with regard to this word hallow, what does it mean when he hallowed be his name? Or into King James it says, Hallowedeth be thy name. So we can understand that if we put hallowed be God or hallow God, that makes sense. But what does it mean when he says hallowed be thy name? Kind of puts us back to the Ten Commandments, right? Right. So one specifically talks about not taking the Lord's name in vain. Okay. All right. So how is it that we might be better people to understand how to hallow God's name, how to revere, to venerate, to respect, to hold in high esteem or holiness? How is it that we would be able to, what, what, what might we do to better understand what that might look like? So it's one thing to say we want to respect it, we want to revere it, we want to venerate it, we want to count it as holy. But what is it? What would lead us into having that uh, ability in ourselves that would express it out externally to, from ourselves? Okay, since you asked. When the scripture says, hallowed be your name, let's just think about what the name means. What, it mean, what does it mean, God having a name? And so that's the question, what's in a name? So, Richard here, uh, what's your name mean, Richard? Don't know. Okay, Leanne, what's your name mean? Scott, what's your name mean? I'm not sure. Yeah. So the point's crystal clear that none of us know what our name means. <laughs> so where are you going, preacher? It wasn't that way 
in the Semitic cultures. And when I say Semitic, I'm talking about the Arab cultures. I'm talking about everything from India to the Middle East, uh, from Greece on down into uh, even Egypt and Ethiopia. Names meant something, and they usually were um, indicators of either some forethought of the person's destiny in life or some character trait or attribute that that person had. And so if we want to hallow his name, maybe we ought to study his name. And so tell me, someone here tonight, what we would do to study God's name. Right. So we turn to the scripture. Let me ask you this. So turn to Genesis 1-1, for example. So the first one to Genesis 1-1, go ahead and crack off and read it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay. That's probably pretty consistent with most anybody here that has that. Everybody with us now? In the beginning, God, right? Created heaven and earth. So the idea of God being a creator is encapsulated in our English translation. And I'm opening up a, a resource here. Pardon me, it might take just a minute for it to open up because I don't want to say anything incorrect about the language. But in verse 1 of Genesis, we have the creator God, right? And so here in, in this verse, in, in the original language, the word that you have in there for God is Elohim, E-L-O-H-I-M, in just, just phonetics for English. And in that, what we have is El, which was in the Semitic language, which, is, which would have been all the languages that preceded Hebrew, which would have been Akkadian and several others, uh, all the Arabic languages that would come afterwards that were piggybacked off of that. Um, they used the word E-L-L -L for God. And so we have a generic word, El, for God, and then the, with the suffix of Elohim, meaning creator. And so what we have is creator God. And so if we want to venerate, if we want to esteem, if we want to hold holy, we want to reverence and revere the names of God, there's a whole host of names in the Old Testament and the New Testament for God. Many of them talk about what God does or did and others talk about God's essential nature and his character. And if we want to hallow his name, a good way to do that is to understand his names. Because it's not just one name, it's many names. So even in the New Testament, there's lots of names for God. And some of them, they're not even used in the Old Testament. And so that's what we're going to embark on for the next few weeks is a study throughout Scripture of pulling out Scriptures and saying, okay, when your Scripture says Jehovah, or when your Scripture says the God who sees, or when your Scripture says the God who provides, you need to understand that behind these English words, there is a name for God there that talks about either what he is doing or what he is capable of because of his attributes or his character or his essential nature. And I think what we do is when we better understand these names, these list of names, we understand that we have a God that's actively involved in the affairs of men and is intimately interested in our lives as individuals. And that makes him more personable and more real than what we could ever could have imagined just by reading the word God or Lord or Master in the Scripture. And so that will help us get a better footing to stand on to say hallowed be your names El Shaddai you know what El Shaddai means Almighty God or um, El um, there's a whole series of names not even in the El category but Jehovah so Jehovah Jireh Jehovah Nisi Jehovah Imkadesh Jehovah Tiskanu all these names have meanings and sometimes they're in the midst of stories where you see people striving with God and then there's a place that's named or a marker that's named for an attribute or, an, an, uh, or for an experience with God. And it's indicating his character or his nature or how he's worked in someone's life. 
And I think that when we understand that God still works even in the New Testament, because we'll leave the Old Testament and move to the New Testament, and we'll discover a whole new rich set of names in the New Testament that aren't necessarily transmitted to us through the Old Testament names. And because we're in the age of grace and on this side of the cross and on this side of the resurrection, that we'll better understand how we can say, what's the first word in that verse? Our Father which is a very unique word and a name for God as well. And so when we put the names at the end of the sentence together, we're going to circle back around to the beginning of the sentence when we get to the New Testament, this concept about God being our Father, and we'll tie them all up in a little bow. And hopefully by that time you'll say, wow, I never knew that. And you'll say, where can I get a list of those names? And I'll say, well, it just so happens to be I might have one right here on my computer. So, so Genesis 1.1, 1, 1. and so we look at that and we say, uh, in, in the beginning, God created, and so we have Elohim right there in Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. So that is one of the names of God that you should probably write down in the margin of your Bible or take notes in there about uh, the names of God. How about this? I just mentioned one earlier. I mentioned the name El Shaddai. And I told you already that means God Almighty. And so look at Genesis 17, 1. So this is in the midst of a, um, a reassuring moment that Abraham needed. And Abraham, remember, received his prophecy in Genesis chapter 12. And then in Genesis chapter 15, it's reaffirmed. And now Genesis chapter 17, God's going to speak back uh, to um, um, Abraham here uh, when he's 90 years old. Look, and it says, now when Abram was 90 years old, he says, and the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am God Almighty. That word, El Shaddai. I am God Almighty. And what does that mean? That there is no one that can fort. That no one can stand against God. He is the supreme power. If we want to think about power as in force, be it military force, be it physical force, be it supernatural force, be it natural forces, there's nothing that can stand against God. He is the El Supremo of all power and all might. There is no weakness in him and there's nothing that can compare to his power and his might. And so when we read that word there, he goes on and he says, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. Now, if you had God appear to you and say that to you, you would probably be petrified just like Abram probably was. And you would have no doubt in your mind that he's God Almighty because he probably would have done something you've never seen and never experienced before. And probably like the rest of the Israelites would in Exodus, never wanted to see that display again because it was so awesome. And so he appears before him and says, be blameless. And that would be a tall order if we knew ourselves right. And he says, walk before me and be blameless. That would be something that might be scary to us because... Who am I that I would be blameless before God? And so we see here, he says, walk before me and be blameless. And he says again, notice the, notice the pronouns here. He says, I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. And then it says, Abraham fell on his face. <laughs> he probably said all this so fast that, the distance between the ground and Abram falling on his face, it was just impossible for all this to happen. He said he fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you a father of a multitude of nations. And he goes on through there and the pronouns, the significance of the pronouns is I. God saying, I, I'm going to do this. 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 All he said to Abraham was, walk before me and be blameless. They didn't give him a list of rules. He just said, do it. And he says, and as for you, 
I'm going to make you these things. I'm going to make you the father of a multitude of nations. That's exactly what happened, both through Ishmael as well as Isaac, a multitude of nations. And so that's name number two, uh, El Shaddai, uh, Genesis 17.1. So it's about 22 after, and I'm not going to get into the next one. But I would say that if you Google this, you might be able to find some interesting things to read between now and next Wednesday. Names of God. Google that, and it might be a profitable time and just reading what some of the names of God are. And you might even find some ones that really amaze you and thrill your heart in the midst of that. So that's where we'll be going, continuing on in the Old Testament with the names of God. And there's probably about, I think here, about another dozen or so that I've got down to talk about. And once we do that, then we'll transition into the New Testament and we'll draw, uh, draw out some differences between what we see in the New Testament and also in the Old Testament. So any thoughts or questions about the names of God so far? It's not Bob and it's not Ralph. It's not the big man in the sky. We're hallowing the names. All right. Okay, well, I'm going to give, uh, give Jay some minutes back and the uh, praise team can begin to practice as soon as everybody's here. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that uh, you are a God that's not nameless. Uh, I'm reminded of Paul when he was there in Athens and he, he walked down from Mars Hill and he walked down the, uh, the, 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 the colonnade there and there was a God here on this statue and a God there. And then the last statue he comes to, it, it says, to the unknown God. And Paul preached about that unknown God to the Greeks and said he is the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who's ordained times and epochs and the coming and going and rising and fall of not only empires but men. And that he sent his son to reveal God as he, as he really is to us and that he was crucified, laid, buried, and resurrected on the third day as the scriptures foretold. And Lord, he has a name, a name that's above all names, the scripture says, the name Jesus, a name that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to the Father's glory that he is Lord one day. Lord, may it be that more names praise the name and proclaim the name of Jesus because they have a relationship with him than the other way. And Lord, may we be people that make that possible with our friends and family and those who are all around us that make it easy to come to know Jesus rather than more difficult. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless and have a wonderful night.